The Alliance of Confessing Evangelicals presents the timeless teaching of Dr. Donald Gray Barnhouse. Now someone says, are you teaching that terrible Presbyterian doctrine of the security of the believer? Yes, I am. This is what was called from the days of Calvin and John Knox, the final perseverance of the saints. This is certainly once saved, always saved, because, and I want to show you what it is and what it isn't, because what I'm preaching tonight is that salvation is God's work, and that he plants life within us, and that only he could take it out of us, and he never will. Over a half a century ago, the late Dr. Donald Gray Barnhouse, then pastor of 10th Presbyterian Church in Philadelphia, saw the need to spread God's word beyond the hearing of his local congregation. He started the radio outreach, which has become known as Dr. Barnhouse and the Bible. The application of God's word as taught by Dr. Barnhouse is as relevant today as when he first taught over the radio airwaves decades ago. The message we will be featuring on today's edition of Dr. Barnhouse and the Bible is entitled Assurance Part 2. If someone saved your life by pulling you from a burning car, would you insult that person and treat them like an enemy? Of course not. You would express kindness, love, and gratitude toward that person. Some people think the doctrine of eternal security and the assurance of salvation leads people to be careless about fighting against sin and living a holy life that pleases God. Knowing that Jesus has saved you completely and eternally from the fires of hell should be the most compelling motivation to pursue holiness and serve God in loving obedience. The scripture text for this edition of Dr. Barnhouse and the Bible 1 John chapter 5, we're looking at verses 9 through 13. Here again is Dr. Donald Gray Barnhouse with a message entitled, Assurance, Part 2. Suppose a preacher got up and said this, If we receive the witness of men, the witness of God is greater. For this is the witness of God, which he hath testified of his Son. He that believeth on the Son of God hath the witness in himself. He that believeth not God hath made him a liar, because he believeth not the record that God gave of his Son. And this is the record, that God has given unto us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. He that hath the Son hath life, and he that hath not the Son of God hath not life. These things have I written unto you that believe in the name of the Son of God, that ye may hope that ye will have eternal life, and that you might believe on the name of the Son of God. Isn't that terrible? Doesn't this rob the Christian of all confidence and hope? These things have I written unto you that believe in the name of the Son of God, that ye may hope that ye will have eternal life. No, no, no. Not that you may hope that you will have. But the scripture says, These things have I written unto you that believe in the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have, not that you may hope that you will have. But if any man be in Christ, he's a new creation. And there, in the Holy Spirit, in your heart and life, he comes to dwell. And in addition to the word of God saying, I have given to you eternal life, there's a second voice that says, yes, 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 it's true, it's true. Do you know that you have eternal life? Do you believe that God loves you? Oh, yes, 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 says a voice. And as I preached, in addition to my voice in your ear, is there a second voice in your heart saying these things are true? These things are true? That's the Holy Spirit. There it is in my text. He that believeth in the Son of God hath the witness in himself. And that witness is the witness of the Holy Spirit. It was ten years ago or so that I had a meeting like this in Portland, Oregon. 
And a young Baptist minister came to me after the meeting and said, would you like to take a trip up the Columbia River Highway? And I said, yes, I would. It's the most beautiful, I think, in the whole world of all the valleys I've ever seen. He said, I'll be for you tomorrow morning at 8 o'clock in front of the hotel. And the next morning he was there. I was waiting in the front and I stepped into the car and his wife was seated in the middle, the three of us in the front seat. We pulled out into traffic and she said, oh, I had such a blessing last night in the meeting. My heart was just turning somersaults. I said, that's an interesting translation. She said, what do you mean? Well, I said, what did you say? Give me the exact words. And she said, well, I said, my heart was turning somersaults. And I said, I replied, that's an interesting translation. She said, I don't understand. Well, I said, what really was happening was the Holy Spirit was bearing witness with your spirit that you were a child of God. Now, in the King James Version, the translation is, his spirit beareth witness with my spirit that I'm a child of God. In the Portland, Oregon translation, it is, my heart was turning somersaults. I said, that's exactly what it means, but it's the same thing. Well, sometime shortly thereafter, I went home and I was preaching in my own church. It's a long church with galleries, square galleries on three sides. And up on this side, with his hand on the, the iron bar rail that is at the top of the uh, ramp there, there was a boy of 14 who had his chin on his hands and he was leading forward, drinking in every word that I was saying. That morning I had decided to speak on what God says he has done with our sin. And I had 11 verses down, and I'd said I'll speak for three minutes on every one of the 11, and that'll give me a 33-minute sermon. So I got up that day, and I said our sins are forgiven, forgotten, cleansed, gone, atoned for, covered, cast into the depths of the sea, blotted out as a thick cloud, remembered against you no more forever, removed as far as the east is from the west, and cast behind God's back. And my conclusion was... How firm a foundation, ye saints of the Lord, is laid for your faith in his excellent word. They're forgiven, forgotten, cleansed, gone, atoned for, covered, cast into the depths of the sea, blotted out as a thick cloud, remembered against you no more forever, removed as far as the east is from the west, and cast behind God's back. And that boy up there in the gallery never took his eyes off me. When I finished and went down, shake hands with the people, the crowd went out. And as it thinned, this boy came up to me and pulled my sleeve, and I looked around. He said, good sermon, Doc. I said, you liked it? He said, gee, we're sure sitting pretty, aren't we? <laughs> and he went, he went on his way. He went on his way. His way was to finish high school and to finish college very well and to finish Princeton Seminary and to be ordained to the Presbyterian ministry. But that day, he gave me a new translation. Gee, we're sure sitting pretty. Now, there are three translations. <laughs> Philadelphia Revised Version. Gee, we're sure sitting pretty. Columbia River Translation. My heart was turning somersaults. King James Version. His spirit beareth witness with my spirit that I am a child of God. In your heart does the voice of the Holy Spirit say, My beloved is mine and I am his. That's how we can know we're alive in Christ. Listen to me. If you're here tonight and if there is not a second voice within you saying, Yes, yes, I am alive in Christ. I doubt whether you're saved. I tell you in all of the greatest desire of my heart, give diligence to make your calling and election sure. If the Holy Spirit is not saying to you, yes, child, his blood was shed for you. I have given to you eternal life and you shall never perish and no one shall pluck you out of my father's hand or my hand. I and the Father are one. Oh, how wonderful it is to stand there and say, it's true, it's true, God has given me eternal life and the Holy Spirit to echo, yes, 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 yes. Now, lastly, there's a third way where I know I can save. Firstly, objective, the book says so. Secondly, subjective, the Holy Spirit says so. Thirdly, oh, you can say it in so many different words, philosophical words, existentially, experimentally. God very definitely gives us proof after proof after proof that we belong to him. It says in 1 John, we know that we've passed from death to life because we love the brethren. That's one way. You know, when we are coming to Christ, because this is always a process, God plants the new life in the believer, and there's quite a time before the believer is aware of it. 
I'm quite sure that anybody who ever says, I accept Christ, I'm quite sure he has been born again long time, maybe several years. Because in Adam, our acceptor was broken. But when God makes us alive, the first thing he does is give us in the new nature a new acceptor. And it is with this that we accept Christ, not with our old Adamic nature, but with a new nature. No man calls Jesus Lord except by the Holy Spirit. And oh, how wonderful it is to know. And by the way, don't let anybody misteach you or destroy your hopes by saying, well, if you don't know when you're saved, you're not born again. This is not true. Is there any person here who could stand up and take oath in court of the date of your birth? That's the only hearsay evidence that courts will allow. What was your birthday? March 28th. Well, how do you know? My mommy done told me. <laughs> there is no other way that you can know. You can't say, well, I was there when it happened. <laughs> How old were you before you knew you were alive? Did you sit up in your baby carriage and say, cogito ergo sum, I think and therefore I am a human being? There is a profound difference between me and this cat. You did not. You were four years old before you knew you were alive, maybe more than that. Oh, how wonderful it is to know that God made us alive. And as time goes on, we came, oh, I know this, that when I was a young preacher, people said, when were you saved? And I said, glibly, when I was 15. But then when I began to know my Bible better, and I looked back and I said, now, wait a minute, I remember when I was eight, how I appeared before the session that I confessed Christ and joined the church. And then I remembered why when I was five, I remembered very well, a man gave me a nickel on my birthday and said, what are you going to do when you grow up? And I said, I'm going to preach. And then I said to my mother, when I was two, did I sing Jesus loved me this I know? She said, oh, of course you did. Well, someone says, now, Dr. Barnhouse, you're disturbing me because if you're going to say that God had made you alive already then, well, th 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 this means th th that your will didn't have anything to do with it. That's right. We're now becoming biblical. And in John 1.13, it says, Who are born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And I've been made alive through Christ. And immediately I begin to grow. And I begin to understand all that God has given me in Christ. And the Holy Spirit shows me. Now I'm sad that my advance hasn't been as rapid as it could be. I remember a story of James McNeil Whistler. We all know him through his famous portrait of his mother. Well, when Whistler was 59 in England, they gave a one-man show for him in one of the museums. Paris lent the Whistler's mother, and out of some of the great castles of England came the portraits that he had painted, and they assembled two, about 200 of his paintings in a one-man show. It was to open on a Wednesday morning at 9 o'clock, and there was a young art student went to the door when they were first open, and he walked in and right in front, there were two great portraits by Whistler, one that he had done when he was 19 and one that he had done when he was 59, that he had recently finished. And when the young man came in and saw those two paintings, painted 40 years apart, he noted he saw that right in front of the two, Whistler was standing there looking at them. And the boy stood behind Whistler as Whistler looked at the painting he had done when he was 19 and at the one that he had recently finished. And the boy intruded and broke in and said, you must be very proud, Mr. Whistler, of the tremendous progress. And Whistler turned, and there were tears running down his cheeks. He said, young man, I was standing here thinking that I had not lived up to the promise which I showed as a young man. Well, every one of us who knows the Lord, each one of us who knows the Lord must think in these same terms. I have not lived up to the promise which he first showed in me in the first days of my salvation. But nevertheless, there is growth. Of this we can be sure. It's been growth perhaps like these reports of the rise of the cost of living, always going up, always going up, but sometimes going down and up and down and up, but always up. And this is the course of the life of a Christian. Being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. For the path of the just is as a shining light that shineth more and more unto the perfect day.
And so I know that I'm passed from death to life because I've seen this conflict and his working within my heart. Now let me explain to young Christians that you'll always pass through times of confusion. In fact, I don't think anybody will ever come to become a very good Christian until they've passed through great confusion. Because you're born and brought up with the idea that you can do, must do everything for yourself. When you're a little boy, Johnny, learn to feed yourself. Learn to button your own clothes. Learn to tie your shoes. Do it yourself. They keep baby books to put down the dates. He first stood on his own feet at such a time. He took his first step at that time. And that's something to be recounted to the second generation. And then the minute you've told the child you've got to do everything for yourself, you have to come and say to him, now you must do nothing for yourself in the sphere of salvation. Jesus Christ says, without me, you can't do very much. Oh, no, I made a mistake. Without me, you can do nothing. And this is what we must learn. That without him, we can do nothing. And he has come in and give us all things. It's not necessary for you to know when you're saved. The important thing is, do you know, can you say, I am alive in Christ? I am alive in Christ. And then as you become aware of this aliveness, as you go on, there are conflicts. There'll be a moment when your spiritual experience is such, you've got just enough of Christ to be miserable in a nightclub and not quite enough to be happy in a prayer meeting. <laughs> but nevertheless, you're going to grow. Nevertheless, his Holy Spirit within you is going to lead you. Let me conclude with this. How can I know that I'm saved? One, the book says so. Two, the Holy Spirit says so. Three, in daily life and experience, I see by his work within me that he is at work building me. And lastly, I want to close with this illustration of what would have to happen before God could send you to hell, if you're a believer. What would have to happen before God could send you to hell, if you're a believer in Christ? Few years, quite a few years ago now, I had spent 16 months crossing Asia, and my wife and children had been in Berlin during all that time, studying there, and I came back and picked them up to pick them up there, and when I got in town, the children, of course, were glad to see me, and they wanted very much, they wanted me to see their playground where they had spent most of their free time in the previous year and a half. The Berlin Zoo was the greatest zoo in the world before the war, and it had this playground in it, and a family ticket had been purchased so they could go in and out, and the children played there near the boarding house where they lived, and they'd played there all the time. Well, they wanted me to go, and I went, and I took my movie with me, and I took some movies uh, of them, and they're playing, and the keeper that had watched over them, the guard, and then they wanted me to go through the zoo and see their animals. Now, one of the most famous animals in the Berlin Zoo was Roland. Roland was a sea elephant. He was a sea elephant that weighed over two tons. He's one of the few animals in history that in the last few years have had their picture on the cover of Time magazine. Uh, before the war, when they were writing up the zoo, they had put Roland's picture, their magnificent beast. He weighed two tons, a little more than two tons. He was in a great big pool that was almost as big as this church, and it had a ramp going up one side to a platform about 20 feet above the water. And at four o'clock we went there and Roland was fed and there were hundreds of people to watch. And Roland was very excited, swimming up and down the pool and barking and out came a keeper with a great big bucket. And there was another bucket beside his si uh, side and he took fish and he began to throw them. He'd throw them at one end of the pool and Roland would go back and forth and he caught every one of those fish. And finally, after he had exercised up and down the pool, the, the keeper began to throw them up the ramp. And Roland began to inch his wife foot by foot, go up the ramp on his flippers and just and take two tons along. It was quite a job, but he went, he caught every one of the fish. And when he got to the very top, the keeper took a specially big fish and threw it up in the air. And Roland went for it without wings. And down he came all two tons and hit that water with a mighty splash. He caught the fish, but with a mighty splash that sent water far and wide. Well, when we got back to the United States, the movies were processed, and the night came, we were showing them, and the children saw it. Oh, look, there's Herr so-and-so, Herr Fossum, the guard at the play cap, then here. Oh, there's Roland. And we went through all of this scene, this whole process, and the children were delighted. 
And just at that moment, when it turned to something else, I stopped the movie, put on the reverse lever, and ran the film backwards. All the water came down, and Roland floated up 20 feet, spit a big fish. The keeper caught it and put it back in the bucket. And Roland began to go backwards, spitting fish. And the keeper caught every one of them and put them in the bucket. Back and forth he went across the pool, spitting fish. The keeper caught every one of them and put them back in the bucket. This became a wildly hilarious scene in our home, you can well imagine. And one of the themes in our bringing up of the children, uh, some nights after dinner when Daddy was home, Daddy, can we have movies tonight? <laughs> and the little ones would come, Daddy, please, please let Roland spit fish. <laughs> and it was so wonderful they wanted. Now listen, the reason I have told you that story is because none of you will ever forget it. Now listen to what I want to apply to it, if I may use this story of running a film backwards. Here is what would have to happen before God sent you to hell. Jesus Christ is now seated at the right hand of God. He'd have to stand up and back away from the Father. He'd have to go to that place in heaven where he arrived on the day of the ascension, and he would have to descend to the Mount of Olives. He would have to back through the 40 days to that time of the resurrection when his body would be back in the shroud and his spirit would be in paradise in hell waiting for that day to come and he would have to back through that and three days they would after some time they would put the cross back up his body back on the cross and the cross back up he would have to from death he would have to come back to life the word it is finished would have to be pronounced in reverse he would have to go backwards through those six hours of suffering You'd have to see the cross come down. The nails would go out of his hand and the scars would heal up. He would step away from the cross. And then God could send you to hell. But as long as Jesus Christ is who he said he is, and as long as Jesus Christ is on the throne of God, my salvation is as sure as God. The foundation of God standeth sure. The Lord knoweth them that are his. And let everyone that names the name of Christ depart from iniquity. Do you have eternal life? Let us bow in prayer. O oh God our Father, we ask thee to do what we cannot do. We have spoken this short distance to the ears of these people. Wilt thou speak to the heart? And in this closing moment, I'm not going to ask anyone to stand up or come forward, but I am going to ask you this. Quietly, with every head bowed, and I don't want you to look around, I want to ask this. How many of you know that before you came in here tonight, you could say, I am certain, I know that I have eternal life. I know that I have it. Before I came in here tonight, would you put up your hand? Yes, thank you. Now take them down. How many here tonight who said, well, I wasn't sure, but now I am. From now on, I know that I have eternal life. And God this night has given me the assurance. If you have had this happen to you tonight, would you just lift up your hand and then take it down again? Yes, yes, I see. Yes, I see. Yes, I see. All over the room, up and down. Thank you. Now may I make this conclusion to you. For the most part, everyone here... The great mass of you knew before you came in tonight that you had eternal life. You're an audience of believers. I was right in calculating my message, not as an evangelistic message, because you have not brought the unsaved here. And that's why 98% of the people put up their hands that before they came in, they knew that they had eternal life. We're grateful for those who came in who have... God has brought along in growth tonight to this knowledge. But you're responsible for bringing people under, even under the preaching of the word, even though I am speaking primarily to Christians. I have known of many people who have been saved while I was teaching Christians how to grow up. For the Lord says, do the work of an evangelist and make full proof of thy ministry. And we declare the truth and God uses it to make people alive. May God speak to your hearts. And may you come to the place where you know that you have eternal life and let God have his way in you. Oh God, 
Seal this to us in Jesus' name. Amen. If you trust in Jesus Christ for your salvation, you will never have anything to do with the justice of God. His wrath against your sin has been dealt with once and for all in the death of His Son. You can listen to an audio copy of today's message and additional Bible teaching by the late Dr. Donald Gray Barnhouse anytime, anywhere around the globe via the Internet by visiting the Alliance of Confessing Evangelicals website at alliancenet.org. Log on to this week's message entitled, Assurance, Part 2. An audio copy of today's teaching is also available by calling us toll-free, 1-800-488-1888. Today's message again is entitled, Assurance, Part 2. Or simply request message number Q173B. We would also like to make available to you our free booklet entitled, 101 Difficult Questions Answered. What is the unpardonable sin? Can Satan read your thoughts? What is the baptism of the Holy Spirit? Bible study and theological reflection can raise many questions that are difficult to resolve. Did Jesus go to hell and suffer there? How does evolution conflict with the Bible? Should churches practice foot washing? This free booklet will give you scriptural answers to these and other questions about God and His Word. Ask for your free copy of 101 Difficult Questions Answered When You Call or Write. Dr. Barnhouse and the Bible is a radio ministry of the Alliance of Confessing Evangelicals headquartered in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. We exist to promote a biblical understanding and worldview, drawing upon the insight and wisdom of Reformation theologians from decades and even centuries gone by. We seek to provide contemporary Christian teaching materials which will equip believers to understand and meet the challenges and opportunities of our time and place. Dr. Barnhouse and the Bible comes to you through the generous gifts of our listeners. If you have benefited from this broadcast and would like it to continue, please prayerfully consider a donation to help us keep this ministry on the air. For more information or to make a contribution to support and further our work, contact us by writing Alliance of Confessing Evangelicals, Box 2000, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, 19103. Call us toll free. 1-800-488-1888 or visit us online at alliancenet.org Be sure to ask for a free updated resource catalog featuring books, audio teachings, commentaries, booklets, daily devotionals, videos, and a wealth of other materials from outstanding Reformed teachers and theologians, including Donald Gray Barnhouse, James Montgomery Boyce, Michael Horton, and Martin Lloyd-Jones. Then join us again next time for more classic teaching on Dr. Barnhouse and the Bible.